I'm Anthony Scaramucci, and welcome to Open Book, where I talk with some of the most interesting and brilliant minds in our world today. Joining us on Open Book, uh, the author of The Persuaders at the Front Lines of the Fight for Hearts, Minds, and Democracy, Anand Girdadas. Now, I got to, come on, that's not so bad for an Italian from Long Island, the pronunciation, yeah, right? It's, I mean, you, you should just so make bad. like an Italian version of the name. That's right. what happens Anand- when I go to Europe. What's amazing is they just make their own version of the name in every country, and it's great. All right. Well, how would you pronounce the name? Go ahead. Anand Gerdardas. Gerdardas. All yeah. right. I'm getting closer, okay? But I yeah. got to tell you, I am- My Italian oh. name is Andy Ghirardelli. All right. I like that. You see that? You see, yeah. you would have hung out with me, okay? I, I would have thought <laughs> you were a founder of the chocolate company if, if you had said said that about yourself. I can get you amazing right, well, discount. I want to I I I hold up the book for a second, okay? And- uh, you and I go back a long ways. The book is brilliant. Okay, I I read it over the weekend, and I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you something I said, and I want you to react to it. I turned to my wife and I said, "Anon has once again written a great book. There's scintillating truth in this book about what is actually going on in America, but not just America. We're going to talk about this because it's I think it's going on in the UK, France, other Western democracies." And yet it's so truthful that I think there's too much pain in it for people to really listen. What am I, what am I getting wrong about that? I think that's probably true, whether that serves me or not. And I, I think it, it is what I think of the function as a writer to be. Um, you know, I think uh, one of the reasons societies keep writers around or should keep writers around uh, is that writers are, you know, people who maybe are a little bit unaffiliated uh, when, you know, most people have jobs or work for big organizations or are part of political parties or companies. As you know, as someone who's been part of many companies, you sign a lot of paperwork uh, saying you can't entirely say what you think. Uh, you, you've probably broken a lot of those contracts in your, in your yeah, own well, life. Yeah, I mean, that's the reason why I got <laughs> fired. I mean, you know, General Kelly told me, yeah, you didn't get fired for the comment about Steve Bannon. You got fired because you were telling the truth. It was uncomfortable for people. They didn't, they didn't want to hear it. But and I think I, it just seems to me that that's the job of the writer. The writer is, you know, I think Tom Wolfe said the kind of the village gossip who, who, who says publicly the things that everyone is whispering to them but can't say because of the positions that those people have. And I think this book is no exception. I think there were a lot of truths. These are not my truths from the depths of my soul. These are reported truths that I was hearing from a lot of people in the fight for democracy, in different phases of the fight for democracy right now, because we are in an existential fight for democracy. And a lot of the people in that fight who I talked to had this concern that the pro-democracy cause, although it's fighting a righteous fight, isn't really as interested as it should be in bringing people in, in being bigger tomorrow than it is today. And that has to change. Is this a white person's problem? And just hear me out for a second, okay? The whites were in charge, let's call it 1776 to today, uh, but brown and black people are now going to be in the majority as it relates to the democracy. So uh, if the whites are in charge, no problem. Let's have the rules of democracy. Oh, wait a minute, black and brown people could be in charge. So let's change the rules. What do I got wrong about that? There's there's no question that if you had to pick like one fundamental force in American public life today, and of course, there's a lot of things going on, but if you had to pick one, I think you'd say this was a country founded, uh, you know, with on paper, some very sweeping ideals for all mankind. But in practice, as you know, they only really applied to propertied white men at the beginning. And then the property relax, you know, requirement was relaxed. And then the male requirement was relaxed. And only in the 20th century was the, was the kind of requirement around whiteness relaxed. And it is absolutely the case that as this country has opened up its meaning and institutions and rights to more and more people, uh, a, a shrinking minority of white Americans, and to be clear, it's not all white Americans by any means, a shrinking minority of white Americans has concluded that they would rather break the republic than share it. That's the choice, right? You can, we can share it or we can break it. And, and I think there, this is not 
we're not unique in this experience around the world as you were as you were talking about. It is easier to share resources and 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 believe in a democracy when everybody looks the same, right? I mean, you know, we talk about Sweden and Norway and they're they're having all these great safety nets. Well, if you ever been to those countries, you know, it's 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 easy to look around and say these people I'm these are people I'm willing to share with. These are people I'm willing to be in a safety net with. Um, we are trying to do something in this country that is quite different with all due respect to Sweden and Norway, with all due respect to France and Germany, with all due respect to India and China. None of those countries are actually on the path we are to creating a truly uh, plural country made of the world, forged of the world, people from every kind of background. And I sometimes think those of us who want to live in that world, who want to live in a, in a future of continued expanded liberal democracy, multiracial democracy, we don't do enough of a good job of reminding ourselves that we're trying to do a really hard thing, a thing that maybe has not quite been proven out in the world. And so this revolt against the future, which is what I regard the kind of Trumpist, increasingly fascist movement as being, this revolt against the future, in some ways is a natural movement of resistance to progress that is happening. And I wrote the book because I want the forces of progress to get their shit together and figure out how to not just warn about the far right extremists, not just complain about them, not just be outraged by them, not just be reacting to them all the time and pointing at them, but actually to out compete them, to build a movement that is bigger, better, feistier, more fiery, more magnanimous, more merciful, and more effective. Well, I, I, I got something out of the book, all of that, but I also got a little bit of a restatement of the founding fathers out of this book in a weird way. Just let me test this on you because this is what I heard in your book, that they got it right, but they were too exclusionary. And so we've had all this amendments and all this social progress to make it more inclusionary and now it's probably time to restate the ideals of what a republic is and self-government is and recognize that if we become less tribal, less black and white, brown versus black, black versus white, white versus brown, et cetera, and we become more inclusive, the diversity of those ideas and the ability to learn from each other's life experiences would just lead to a better quality of life for all of us. Is that what I'm getting from your book or not? Yeah, absolutely. And and look, you know, not to make this about some places versus other places, but like you and I live in New York City, right? So you and I already live in this world, right? If you're living in much of California, you're already living in this world. Actually, in a lot of places in this country, you're living in a world, this world, right? When you and I walk, step outside in New York City, you are hearing languages from all over. You are encountering people. You work with people. I work with people who represent the most intelligent, passionate, committed, creative people from around the world kind of cherry-picked by the United States to come here and invest their talents and dreams here, build their families here. You and I live in that world, and I don't think we would have it any other way, right? I don't think you, whether you're white like you or brown like me, I don't think I would go or you would go trade it to live in a place of a monoculture, right? I could go live in India where everybody, you know, comes from a background I do, you could go, there's a reason we're not living in those places, right? There's and a reason know, our I, ancestors chose to come couldn't, here. Couldn't agree with you more. And I am laughing a little bit because I'm white now. I can tell you that my grandmother did not feel white. Correct. It took your people, it took your people some time to become yeah. white in the American. Yeah. But what I'm laughing about is my Italian American buddies that I live with, they're all pro Trump. And I'm like looking at them. Okay. Your grandmother was told that she couldn't get a job anywhere. There were signs that said, no Italians need apply. And they told my grandmother to go back to the countries they originally came from. And that was the fight I got into with Donald Trump because he was saying that to the, uh, the four congresswomen, ironically, three of which were born here in the United States. So it's this nativism, this racism. I want to, I want to, let me, let's talk about your, let's talk about your Italian American friends for a second. Because yeah. on the one level, I would say, and I, I recognize that kind of type you're talking about exactly, right? And there's so many versions of it in this country right now. On the one hand, I would hold them responsible for their own views and 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 hold them responsible oh, no for quite, no quite. a kind, of, a kind so, of narrowness, right? It's so misguided and it's so lacks context and an understanding of our history. It's so misguided. 
But let me make a second point. I also would hold what I call the pro-democracy movement, because this is not just about Democrats and Republicans, right? This is like, do you believe in democracy at this point? Yeah, do you not? 100%. I, I would also hold the pro-democracy, pro-inclusion movement that wants that future. I would hold them accountable for failing to organize and win over people like that also, right? Because I imagine, maybe I'm wrong, I imagine your, your friends you're talking about, th these are not clan robes people, right? These are probably... No. Decent people, people who would who would treat treat people of color very nicely in their personal life, right? All of that, right? I, right? I know exactly who you're talking about. And so what I think has happened there, it's at the heart of the, the story of the persuaders, is we have failed to tell those people a better story about how to think of America, right? The right, for all of its narrowness and kind of dystopianness right now, I think is better at message. It's better at narrative. It's better mm -hmm. at telling a story about America that is easy to access, that plays into the fears and anxieties people have. And I think what we need to do uh, is to build a pro-democracy movement that is better at persuasion so that guys exactly like who you're talking about um, are not only interpersonally kind to people of color who are their neighbors or uh, they work with, but are able to go from that personal interaction and that personal decency they have to supporting a vision of a country that operates like that at scale for everyone. I mean, I mean, it's very well said. You all, you know, you're also talking about the condescension of some people, you know, frankly, on the left, there's a lot of condescension towards the people on the right. And that's why the right tries to own the libs and all this sort of nonsense that goes on. I want to test two things on you. Uh, when I got done reading your book, I wrote some notes to myself and I was like, I just love to ask Anand these questions. Okay. So in the 1930s, Henry Luce went to Moscow and he interviewed Joseph Stalin. And Stalin said that he would wreck the United States. It would take him 10 years. And Luce, of course, was a staunch American, you know, pro, you know, sort of a conservative Republican. He said, Well, what do you mean? He said, Well, you're a tribal nation, you're a polyglot. You are not a melting pot, but you're just a series of tribes. And with the forces of the KGB and all of the disinformation techniques we have here in Russia, we're going to split your tribes and we're going to cause a second civil war and destroy your nation. And so what Stalin got wrong was the love that our grandparents had for the country. Uh, even if they were being discriminated against, it was still way better than where they came from. And then, of course, the advent of the Second World War galvanized the whole country. Uh, but it, what he also got wrong, though, Anand, was they didn't have the social media mechanisms in place to do what they were saying because the media was controlled by some corporations that were mostly pro-American. Okay, now fast forward to Vladimir Putin. He's got those mechanisms. He can put, put that pipe of disinformation into the social media sewage system. Uh, and he can create havoc inside the country. Okay, so don't react to that yet because I'm going to another quote and I want you to synthesize both. So while we have that going on, Lee Kuan Yew, before he died, the founder of Singapore, in one of his last interviews, they said, well, so are you optimistic or pessimistic about America? In his 90s, Mr. Lee said, no, no, I'm very optimistic about America because America can draw from the whole world. You can come to America in five short years. You are American, Singaporean American, Italian American, Indian American, and a result of which they can have this reservoir of intellectual capital that's never ending. That is not true for Germany, Japan, China, et cetera. You don't have that level of assimilation. Uh, and so synthesize these things for me. Are we, is Stalin right? Are we too tribal and our enemies can break us up? Is Lee right, where if we get the immigration policies right, we can continually renew America, version 3.0 and 4.0 America? Who's right? I think in, in certain ways, they're both telling an important truth. And what is not resolved is which of those truths is going to dominate the 21st century yeah, in America. So, well, which, which one, in your let opinion, me, is? Let me, let me take each one in turn, though, because I, I lived the Lee Kuan Yew truth personally, in a way that I want to sh share with you, because I think it has really 
informed my understanding of America in a way that sometimes makes me think about this a little bit differently than a lot of my own allies on the political left, which is, I am, as you know, I'm critical of a whole bunch of things in this country, as are you, and critical of fundamental structures and, and systems in this country that do not treat certain people well. However, I'm also the son of immigrants who came to this country from India, chose this country, became American. And we had a very interesting experience when I was seven years old, living in Shaker Heights, Ohio. My parents got kind of bored of you know, their adrenaline-fueled immigrant adventure. First, it was hard. It was challenging. How do you figure out the video game of a new country? And then they got it. Two cars, house in the suburbs, two kids. It kind of got easy, and they crashed. And they were like, let's do it again. Let's immigrate again, right? Very kind of unusual thing. So they, they choose to immigrate to France this time when I'm seven. Now, you got to remember, they're now 10 years. My dad's 10 years further into his career. They have more money at this point. They have more stability. They have more wherewithal. And from the first day we arrived in France, and I remember this as a seven-year-old, watching my parents experience France in this way, it was so clear that this will never belong to you. You will never be part of this. You will never become one of us. You can, it wasn't outright discrimination. It wasn't like you can't be here. It wasn't being treated like crap in restaurants or anything like that. It, it was just like... There is no idea here, native to this country, of people becoming French. It's not a thing. Why? Right? Becoming German is not a thing. Becoming Swedish is not a thing. Becoming we Indian is not a thing. Becoming Chinese is not a thing. My friend Eric Liu wrote a great book called The China Man's Chance. He, he may, observed brilliantly. He says, you know, my family has been in China for all of recorded human history, right? Like we 5,000 years, how many thousands of years Eric Liu's family has been in China? For one generation. Out of those hundreds of generations, his family was not in China. He, I, I think his parents moved here, right? Or maybe his grandparents, right? So one or two generations out of hundreds, they broke the chain of their Chinese citizenship. And Eric made the observation that he could never become a Chinese citizen again, right? I think he was born as an American citizen. There's no way for Eric Liu, who's only been missing from China, his family, for one generation. No way he could ever become Chinese. No way his kids could ever become Chinese. And so my sense of America is that this idea of being able to become an American is one of the most radical ideas in the history of the world. It is an idea we have in many ways failed to extend to all the people we were supposed to for all of our history. But it is a powerful idea worth defending, and we are trying to become something. Uh, and I think it's easier if you think about it as trying to become a process, a journey. We are trying to become something really fucking cool, <laughs> for lack of a more technical yeah, term. I, I'm right? all about it, by the way. I, I, I love your met. I mean, we may not agree ideologically on everything, you and me. We may not, okay? But I love the message. But keep going. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt, but I'm so I, so I think that I'm part is very real. And I, I, I wish more of my friends on the political left would say that part, because I think we need to make sure we are coming across to Americans as people who love the country and love the ideals of the country and understand why they're special and cool. And to make clear, as James Baldwin did, that we are criticizing precisely because we love the country. Precisely exactly. because. Oh, exactly. I, I appreciate that. Any, I and, totally appreciate that. I think the second part of what you're saying, which is what Stalin uh, attempted to do and Vladimir Putin has done, is to make a gamble that the same phenomenon I just described, a country made of all the world instead of, you know, a nation of people who look like each other's cousins, um, that this is too hard. That was what Stalin, that's what Stalin was telling Henry Luce. That's what Vladimir Putin game. It's too hard. This is not a workable model, right? And so Lee Kuan Yew is, is stating an aspirational, admiring uh, notion, but it's aspirational. It's predictive. We have, we're not quite there yet. We haven't tested it out. We're heading to be this kind of majority minority country, the superpower of color within your and my lifetime. And it's not tested whether it's tenable, whether it can hold together, whether people's desire to 
keep the republic will overwhelm their desire kind of not to share what feels with people who feel alien to them. And so what Putin did, and I start the book with this for a reason, I start the book with these two women, this kind of Russian intelligence officer, Thelma and Louise kind of duo, who came to America in June of 2014, did a road trip around a whole bunch of states, picked up research, tried to kind of absorb the political system the way a reporter, you know, or travel writer would, and then went back uh, to, to Russia and informed this troll farm in St. Petersburg, the Internet Research Agency, which exactly as you say, didn't just try to make us angrier, specifically inflamed these tribal divisions. And, you know, as someone who, who has been, you know, in, adjacent to the political world, you know, like countries, countries have a lot of ways of messing with each other, right? And the U.S. and Russia have like a whole bunch of different arrows in the quiver, right? Um, it's really significant. Like you can, you can take out someone's power grid. You can sabotage some bank. You can do sanctions. You can, right? No, no lack of, no lack of options of sabotage in this ongoing adversarial relationship. Think about this for a second. Vladimir Putin, imagine the meetings that were going on 2012, 2013, 2014. Vladimir Putin presumably orders that the big Russian effort to undercut its greatest adversary, the United States, is getting into our social media and altering and inflaming how we talk to each other. Like, Think of the brilliance of that, right? Of all the things you could do. He said, they can fix the power grid in Houston, right? Like what his calculation was, was that we, that's something we can't fix. If we go down the road of what I would call contempt and dismissal, right? Which is different from anger and division. I actually think anger and division are fine in politics. Like politics is about really hard issues. Like it's going to get real, right? Contempt and dismissal is different from anger and division. Contempt and dismissal is, there's no point bothering with the mooch. There's no point. Someone like him is never going to X, Y, Z. There's no point. There's no point, right? I am angry that the mooch thinks this about taxes leads me to further engagement, makes me want to vote and argue with you, right? Write an op-ed. Yeah. Well, also, my demonize me, though. Demonize me. Make me into but, a two-dimensional but, but, character. But, but when you get to that contempt and dismissal place, of course someone would say that. Those people will always think that. And we're all doing this to each other right now. And I just think it was so interesting. Having participated in this culture myself, I don't know if you feel like you've all, and I think we've all in many ways participated in an increasingly inflammatory, particularly online culture that spills offline, of course. Um, it's interesting to me. Let's just think for a second we were playing into Vladimir Putin's wet dream of how we should relate to each other as Americans to undermine the goal of that kind of country made of the world that Lee Kuan Yew was talking about. I, I, I think it's a brilliant assessment. And, I, and I, this is one of the reasons why I wanted to bring you on. There's something else going on in your book, which to me is the book is loaded with emotion. Um, you make the point, which I agree with, you can't force people through condensation, making them feel bad through pe pe pedantry, pedantic sermonizing. They're not going to change their point of view. You're sitting there on a righteous high horse explaining to them how wrong they are. Uh, and then you bring up AOC, uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, who to me, I think is one of the more brilliant politicians of our time. I don't agree with a lot of her policies. But man, what a workhorse, what a charismatic, and what a force of nature. Um, tell us about the emotion that's out there and blend it in with your observation of AOC. I'll tell you, she, she, um, whether she realized it or not, she kind of wrote herself into the book. I, I started this book right at the beginning of the pandemic, April, April 2020. And I actually briefly had a TV show um, at that time on, on Vice. And she was my first guest, kind enough to be my first guest on that show. And I think either in the run up to the taping or right after the taping, I was texting with her and thanking her for coming on the show. And I mentioned that I was just starting this new book on persuasion. 
And she said something to me, which took me aback. She said, you know, I think of myself as a persuader, as someone who's really, but she, that's not how the world sees me. The world has come to see me as a kind of strident, ideological warrior. And she's like, I get that, but my self-conception is almost completely the opposite of that. And I'm always attracted in storytelling to those kinds of things where people's, you know, self-conception is at war with how the world sees them. We all have that, but that makes such interesting narrative. And so I set out to write this chapter about her, which has become a third of the book. I mean, it's a hundred pages just about her story. And the reason I dwelled on her story so long, and we, we spent a lot of time talking to each other, is that I think she embodies some of the, the difficulties and complications and contradictions and, and new thinking around persuasion in the 21st century. So I think a lot, if you look particularly at the Democratic Party, the, a lot of the old model of persuasion was just like, reach out to the middle by diluting what you stand for, right? So you start with universal health care as an aspiration, but then if you're Obama or Clinton, you kind of water it down to do sort of private insurance, this, that, and, and, and you sort of feel like that way you'll keep a broad coalition. The problem with this for Democrats is that this often, you know, it, it often fails to win over those people in the middle that you're reaching for. They don't go with you anyway. And then you leave your base cold and like no one is, is for you. And this has often happened to Democrats, as you know. So I think AOC represents a very different model of persuasion for the left, which is actually stand for the bold thing. Stand firmly in your feet for the most ambitious version of a thing. Call it the Green New Deal, call it, uh, you know, uh, certain kinds of democracy reform, whatever. Stand, stand far, far ahead of where the consensus is. Provoke, provoke the conversation, right? Hi, this is what the right is so good at and that she is also very good at. Hijack the narrative, provoke, make people go wild. You remember, I'm sure a lot of your friends remember when she proposed that 70% you know, marginal tax on people making $10 million a year or more. Whether it's a good t idea or bad idea, every person in this country was talking about it the next day. That's power, right? The right gets that. Most people yeah. on the left don't know how to do that. She knows how to do it. Provoke. Question. But then she is also good at having taken the bold stance, having anchored yourself in an ambitious vision um, in a way that someone like Joe Biden has been less comfortable doing. Then you have to work people into your vision with a kind of open heart in a way that the left often struggles to do. So you don't reach out by standing for nothing. You reach out by standing firmly for something, something exciting and thrilling, and then meeting people where they are in terms of pulling them into the vision, right? And so to give you a practical example, if I were trying to persuade you on something where we probably have a disagreement, on universal health care finance through a wealth tax or something like that, right? I think what Democrats would do to try to reach you is just have like a kind of very weak offering and be like, maybe the mooch will come along with that as someone c coming out of the business and finance world. I think what I would say to you, I would, I would try to stick to my universal health care single payer kind of demand, but I would try to sell you on it based on my understanding of what you care about, what your values are right? I would say to you, it is an incredible burden on businesses to have businesses have to administer healthcare systems for their employees and for CEOs to be worrying about whether or not they're going to get a plan that their employee's son's leukemia will be taken care of or not. That that's actually a burden that would be very nice to lift from businesses. And then my business friends in France and Germany feel very relieved that they don't have to think about. It. They can actually focus on their business and not like what Aetna plan they're offering their employees and whether they should grant it to people who work 30 hours or 31 hours or 29 hours, right? That would be the kind of argument I'm making, taking a clear stand, but trying to appeal to your moral frame or saying, Mooch, you're a freedom guy. You like the idea of freedom, right? A lot of your, your, your allies in business like that idea of individual freedom. Well, healthcare in this country, the way it functions for a lot of people is like a big Soviet bureaucracy that dictates your life and it's un-American, right? It is, you are not free if you can't quit your job and pursue a brilliant idea you wrote in a napkin in a coffee shop because your kids are not going to have health care if you pursue that idea, right? What I'm doing right now is making arguments to you yeah. that are empathetic, um, I think, 
to how you see the world, but I'm still standing for something firm, right? And and I'm with you philosophically. So let me just say a couple of things, which I think you'll appreciate, because I'm more of a realist than I am an ideologue. Number one, I'm for a woman's right to choose, even though I'm Roman Catholic and I personally am pro-life, but that's my choice. I'm not imposing that on anybody else. So don't judge me for my choice. I won't judge you for your choice. If you look at the First Amendment, my religious freedom allows me to be pro-life, but it doesn't allow me to push my religion onto you. Okay, so that's my view there, and people can like me or dislike me for that. Number two, I am pro-gay marriage. Uh, I was just on Andrew Cuomo's podcast talking about how myself, a Republican, uh, Cliff Asnes, you may not know him, Paul Singer, uh, Republicans, Dan Loeb, we all worked with Andrew Cuomo to move Republican state senators over to the right. As the Dick Cheney. As the Dick Cheney. Well, I'm a libertarian. So I always tell my conservative friends, so you want a smaller government except in my bedroom. For some reason, you want a larger government in my bedroom. Okay. So it's just antithetical and philosophically uh, absurd. But let me keep going. Okay. You're at a point in the society, whether you like it or not. Okay. The Reagan days are over. You're in a point in the society right now where we have a wide income gap. We have a wide wealth gap. You wrote about it in your last book, your third book. And it's painful for me because I grew up like that, Anon. I grew up in an aspirational working class family. Those very same working class families are now desperational. So the wealthy in America, whether they like it or not, they have to come up with a package of services, almost like a suite of equal opportunity. I am not for equal outcomes, like some of your socialist friends. I think that would be a disaster for our society. And I think equal outcomes would do things that are, uh, look at Venezuela. But, who, I can but who, who in American life is actually advocating for equal outcomes? I don't know. Yeah, Bernie Sanders doesn't like rich people. You what, know, uh, what's what, her what, face? No, what, what policy? What's what her face? The, uh, the professor that uh, beats up on me all the time, Elizabeth Warren. She's not in love with rich people, but she likes I mean, to fly I, around I, on a private like, plane, but that, she's not in love that, with rich people. She's in love with her own different. riches. I, I think you know? they, they make a critique of rich people, but I don't think there is a single Bernie Sanders or Warren proposal that would get anywhere close to equal outcomes, right? And, and look at the evidence of that. Her wealth tax, right? It was two cents for 50 million and up three cents on the dollar. You can't, you can't execute that. So what Th- are you going to do? That's a whole different issue. My, my I'm, stock I'm saying, is 100 bucks. You're going to tax me there. It just dropped to 50. Now what are we doing? No, but, am, but I getting, he, am I getting that's the, the whole money back? Thing. Here's, a, here's what I'm saying to you. Yep. Here's what I'm saying to you. If they wanted to equalize outcomes, they'd propose like a 90% tax or a 95% tax on wealth yeah. over a billion. Yeah, if you're never, proposing a three cent gonna... tax on wealth over a billion, you're not trying to equalize. I'm not, I'm not, it's, not, it's not practical. You, that, you're that's better... a, that's a, whether it's practical is a different issue. I'm just saying they're not trying to equalize outcomes. I don't think off. anybody in American life don't, is trying to equalize outcomes. Don't cut the outcomes. top of the ladder, the rungs of the top of the ladder. You're better off lowering the ladder. Create a platform of equal opportunity, a package well, I think that of, was part of the idea that you education, that you, universal income, but education. The idea was that, but then Republicans will say, how do you pay for it? Right. And what they were doing well, with the wealth tax is saying, here's how you pay for it. Well, I would rather a VAT because the VAT is a consumption based tax and the rich are spending the money. And also a lot of people are spending green in the economy. There's a black market economy, as you know, just like there is in Europe. And you would pick up an enormous amount of tax revenues through a VAT. My Republican friends hate the VAT because you can turn the dial on it and it can be confiscatory. But you got to do something. You can't just be, you know, who's the biggest spender ever? How about Donald Trump? Okay, Mr. Conservative of the Conservative Party racked up $8.4 trillion of debt in four years. Okay, so I mean, this this is total hypocrisy at this point. So if you want to fix it, you got to be honest about it, but you got to offer the equal opportunity. And that includes healthcare. One last point about healthcare. Ronald Reagan created universal healthcare in 1986. And let me just explain this obscure fact. In 1986, he signed legislation that required every emergency room doctor and nurse to service somebody if they walked through the door. And so you had people with no health care getting treated for sore throats in emergency rooms all over the country. 
And and what did Mitt Romney say? Mitt Romney said, okay, we can't do that. Okay, Ronald Reagan was right to pass that legislation. We already have universal health care. Let's figure out a way to make it economically efficient. And let's figure out a way to distribute the capital fairly through the system so everybody can get a reasonable amount of health care. If you want Lux Healthcare because you're a gajillionaire, no problem. But we got to give a base level of reasonable health care to every citizen. So, Correct. So I, we agree on that. You don't have to convince a guy like me. What, what, what we have to do is we have to give a little on both sides. This is why I love the book. I'm just going to hold it up again. At the front lines of the fight for the hearts and minds of democracy, the main title is Persuaders. But what I love about the book is... You're making this wonderful observation that we're so close. If we just dial down some of the rhetoric and some of the emotion, we're so close. And if we give a little on each side, we could make the union more perfect. Did I get that right about the book? Or what I, am, what I, am I, I missing? I think I think that's right. And I think there's more common ground than we realize. We have been manipulated by Vladimir Putin, Rupert Murdoch, Donald Trump, the incentives of Mark Zuckerberg and 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 uh, you know Jack Dorsey and other uh, social media barons platforms. A lot of these forces and sources have manipulated us in the direction of greater contempt for each other and greater dismissal. How often do you and I hear just around you, ugh? People like that will never X. These anti-vaxxers will never get the vaccine. Well, a whole bunch of the anti-vaxxers did eventually get the vaccine. Thank you to the people, the organizers who kept pushing and didn't just quit in the first inning and Thank pushed God. and pushed and found new arguments and went to the black community, went to the Latin community, went into white communities in, in rural areas and said, we don't accept that people won't do the vaccine. People will do what's right. They need to be educated. They need to not hear it just from the president or the CDC. They need to hear it from their pastors. And and uh, adjustments were made. And a whole bunch of anti-vaxxers became people with shots in their arm. You know, Thank God. You, you, you heard it with the Trump presidency, right? Like these people, these people voted for him that they, they, they'll never, they'll never defect. Well, I, I heard, I heard that kind of shrug uh, a lot during those four years. And I'm very thankful that a whole bunch of organizers didn't accept that shrug and organized the hell out of that era. And you know what? A bunch of people defected from Trump. A bunch of people. A bunch of people who loved him even after the Access Hollywood tape and everything else decided they didn't want to. And that's why you and I have not been living in the Trump presidency, blessedly, for the last couple of years, right? Yeah. The January 6th commission right we we think we think everything is baked everything's tribal well through evidence through care by completely reinventing the congressional hearing narratively so that it's not 45 people giving statements and it's it's clean it's lean it's efficient you can understand it you can tune in it's appointment viewing they have moved a lot of people in the direction of understanding the criminality of the Donald Trump kind of uh, Donald Trump enterprise um and so it is easy to be fatalistic about other people in this country. And it's easy to believe that people can't change. And I think there is a hardcore group of, frankly, fascists in this country right now who are not going to change, who really want to They were there in the 1930s. They were, there was Father yeah, Coughlin and Charles Lindbergh. They've Lindberg. always been here. You're right? never going to get those people. You, 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 you've seen these photos but I, of But lynching. I also want to calm the people down on the left. That, you know, they want to cancel it. It's not enough that if you get accused of something, forget about it. It's not... A death penalty, it's a professional death penalty. And it's not even innocent until proven guilty. You're not only guilty, but your career is over. Go home and, uh, you know, uh, sell your house, put your house in foreclosure. What kind of and, nonsense and look, I, is that? You know, I, I, mean, I want to be stupid. clear that I think a lot of what is sometimes called cancel culture is the rise of an accountability culture where people who have been on the margins of American society for a long time now have a voice. Women have a voice that they didn't have before to say, that's ridiculous behavior in a workplace, and women didn't have an easy want, way to I want women pilot, safe. right? Right, all of that. I just interviewed this woman, Jamie Fiore Higgins, about her book, The Bully Market. You know, she was surprised. She couldn't believe that I was willing to do it because Goldman is Mother Goldman. All roads lead back to Goldman, like in the Roman Empire. 
And Goldman did the wrong thing here. They should have read the book and invited her in and said, okay, how do we fix this? Rather than put their heads in the sand, it was which their PR strategy and their lawyers did. See, this is yeah. why you're so good at what you do because you're bringing the stuff out. You're popping the zit. You know, you're like Dr. Pimple Popper, okay? Probably wasn't the best nickname for you, but that's what you are. Sure. And, and, and you're helping with something like this. And so I'm grateful for you for many different things, our friendship, but also joining me on Open Book. And uh, Anand, let's keep the dialogue going. Thank you so I much love for it. being a part of this. With I, love, I, I need a Republican friend in my life. <laughs> I'm staying. I'm staying as a Republican because it pisses Trump off that I'm a Republican. Okay, and yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna be out there fighting the good fight for normalcy. I love it. Thank you, man. Good to